So look, welcome everyone. Uh, we have about 20 people on the call so far. So welcome to you and I'm sure we'll have other people joining shortly. I see some familiar names in the screen, um, people who have joined us at the Sydney uh, Power BI user group many times in the past. So welcome to you all. Um, also, there's some people dialing in from all around the world. Um, I even see people, uh, Wynn's joined from Perth. Welcome, uh, welcome to you, Wynn. So uh, great to have you on the call. Look, as always, I'd just like to remind you that um, these meetups are sponsored by Iman and his company, Agile Analytics. And at the moment, when we're doing these remote um, virtual calls, there's, there's no real sort of need for sponsorship, but it does take... Um, it does take money and effort to make these events happen. So I just always like to say thanks to Iman for doing that. Um, so today we're absolutely pleased and excited to have um, the two musketeers, the Italians, Marco and Alberto with us. And we've decided to use this technique that Marco suggested to us, which is that um, we would first of all have a video, which on YouTube. So, you know, YouTube's a great way to consume content. You can go back and review it if you missed a little bit. And so, so the objective of this call is to pre-watch the video and then come to the session with your questions. And then that way we can dedicate the time that we have together for answering the great questions that you will no doubt come up with. And, um, and so, yeah, so that's the format. So you should have already watched the, the budgeting video by Alberto. I watched it um, earlier on this afternoon. And um, so hopefully you've got some questions. So there's a QR code on the screen or you can type in the URL, pigeonhole.at. The passcode is uh, Italy. And so, and then, yeah, please start typing in your questions. I will be monitoring the questions and I'll be presenting them one at a time. As you may have heard Marco say, we will be prioritizing the questions based on the content first, so the budgeting tool first. But if we run out of those questions, then we'll be um, happy to take questions on anything else. Um, Marco. No better. I don't think you need any introduction, not with this crowd uh, anyway. So, but maybe I could just start with um, a question for you both, because um, we all fondly call you the Italians. Do you mind this, ter this term? Is this, uh, I I'm assuming it's so. Someone, you might have been grumpy before now if, if you didn't like that term. But yeah, tell me what you think about everyone calling you the Italians. <laughs> I think we, I mean, we try to not uh, be the Italians, when we present ourselves, of course, it, we cannot hide our accent. And so even though we try to improve it, but it will never be, you know, it would not be nothing else than an Italian accent we, that we try to improve. So uh, the, absolutely, no, there is no problem. And actually, it's easier, you know, when, when they say, oh, the Italians, you know that we are Alberto and I, <laughs> it's funny. But we never try. I mean, it's something that uh, spontaneously uh, has been uh, defined. I think Rob, Rob Colley. Uh, Rob Colley started calling us the, the yeah. Italians. He did. That, that's right. Yeah. That's where I picked it up from. Yeah. So. Uh, but I mean, you cannot hide it fine. at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as soon as we start speaking, we move our hands and we do this stuff and we use the hands all the time. Uh, so, of course, yeah. we are Italians. That's it. And, 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 and when I travel, the first thing I do, I look for, uh, you know, where is pizza here? So that <laughs> I cannot hide myself. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, look, I haven't quite worked out this uh, this moderator panel yet. I, I, yep. I think I think I'm looking at the projection panel here. So um, so, but I think maybe we'll just start off with this uh, first question, the one with two votes here. It's coming from Vin uh, from Win. Yep. So uh, Win Microsoft M Excel MVP from from Perth. So Win asks, can you discuss all blank rows versus all versus remove filters? So Alberto, you, you started off using the all function and then you went back and, and made some changes and things. So can you talk to that for us, Alberto? Ah, yes. It's kind of, uh, it's not, it's, it's just DAX. So it's not complex by itself. It's a simple concept, but it's very easy to, to make it wrong. There is a difference between, I guess by all blank rows that you mean all except, that's the function we used in the video. All except removes a filter from a table except from some columns. On the other hand, all and remove filters, all removes filters, all and values, all removes all the filters and values restores the filter. 
Now, understanding the difference is kind of um, intricate and uh, we don't have many questions. So probably it's easier if we, can I share my screen? I just- Yeah, I, I think so. Let how... me, uh, I'll stop share and then hopefully there's a sharing panel that comes up. There is a share screen, yes. Uh, let's use a screen one, share. Do you see my screen now? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Cool. Then I need to move this somewhere else. Okay, uh, just look at this report. I'm having here country region and then the brand. Let's say that I don't want the brand. Instead, I want another column from the customer table, which is the continent that I put here. So now I have uh, the continent and uh, the country. And the country is below the continent. So the continent contains uh, multiple countries, which is wrong because uh, Germany is not in Asia. You, you, you mixed the country from, uh, you, you mixed columns from budget and Let customers. Let me get so rid from you're... that. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then I don't want the, the budget. You want the sales. I want sales. Yeah, but I'm also thinking that this is not the, the best. Use the city. Instead of the, mean, the country. Yeah, instead, instead of, the, of country, the country, use the city. No, the continent is fine. I don't think it's gonna change. Education. Here we go. Uh, Okay, yeah, that should work. Now we have uh, the filter continent that contains <laughs> the continent and uh, the city. Let's create a measure that computes uh, the sales uh, of uh, all the cities in the same continent, uh, because then I, I might want to divide the sales of the Vienna city by the, all the cities in the same continent. So in order to do that, I need to start creating a, a measure a bit larger. Let's call it sales in continent. And I can use hey, so Alberto, so we, are we talking about, are we doing all except here? Is that what you're talking about? Because, sorry, yep. Wynn's question was about all blank rows, not all except. Maybe I, maybe I called it out incorrectly. Um, no, so I, I your... read all, all blank rows. Uh, the thing is that there is no all blank rows uh, function sure. in DAX. Uh, so I, I thought okay. it was... So it might have been all no blank row. Yes, you're right, Alberto. I meant all no blank rows. All non blank rows. Okay, got it. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Yeah. My bad. So we need to talk about something different. So then the all non blank rows. <laughs> <Yeah>. Between apologies. <laughs> all no blank rows versus all versus remove filters. Yeah. I don't remember where we used it in the video, but uh, all no blank rows returns. Uh, all the rows of a column except the blank row. Now, the blank row is the special row that is created when you have an invalid relationship. So you have an invalid relationship and the engine creates a blank row to link all, of the, uh, all the rows that have an invalid code to the blank row. All no blank row does not return this row, whereas all returns it and remove filters, I don't remember. Mark, do you remember? So, so my recollection, um, Alberto, right? was it was to do, when you created the, when you materialized the monthly data table using a calculate table and you tried to create the relationship and it gave a circular yep. reference. And yep. then you went, so, and then you, you referred to this blank row causing the issue because I actually had the, exactly the same question because I didn't understand how that resolves yep. the circular reference issue. Okay. Okay. Alberto, you want okay. to answer? In the meantime, I, I catch the link to the article where we explain this, Alberto. So I will post it in the chat window. Okay. okay, post it in the chat. No, I'm thinking whether we can explain that quickly here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. But we can, yeah. I mean, let's say that we create table, uh, we create a new table, uh, 
let's call it brands. I guess we use brand and we use all product brand. Okay, now brands now returns all the values of the product brand. Make sense? Meaning that uh, the table brands depends from product brand. If any change happens in product brand, I will need to recompute this calculated table because a new brand appeared or a new brand disappears. And the dependency is pretty clear because I'm using product brand. What is less clear is that if I build a relationship between product and brands, so I build this relationship, I also create a dependency from brands to product. And what's the problem, Marco, that I don't remember? Um, no, I think- I need another you, table again. No, Alberto, look at, a, look at a, the code you used for the brands calculated table, because I, I was uh, writing code, uh, I, I was writing the, the URL, I didn't see. Okay, you used all. Now, if you, because you used all- I need another table. To, brand, I need another table. Yeah, once you, you once you join all the tables, once you once you include the link to both the brand and the uh, product, you will start creating a you know circular dependency. So let's not just yet, create. But... Not, but you didn't connect the brands to the budget. And then you have. I to need another include... table. That's the thing. No, but the, but the problem is that you if you go back to the to the. To the to the formula, you are just using a table here. We have to do the union between the, the values that come from the two tables, right? No, you are just using no, the product no, no, brand. No. I do need another table, Mark. You, uh, Alberto, you, you have to include the, the 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 budget brand too, because the budget brand is where the blank all value could brand, come. All budget brand. And now you no. have a problem. Why not? Because that's a that's not a circular dependency. That was a uh, duplicated values. Did they remove it? Okay. It no, the problem is that <laughs> we need another table because otherwise the dependency just flows in one direction. So budget depends on brand. Brand now depends on product and on budget, but neither budget nor brand depends on brand. I need a table that depends. I need to make the circular dependency happen. And to I do think that, that you... I need another table. Okay, uh, sorry, Alberto, if I stop you, but I think that we are going a little bit out of topic because probably in the, you didn't show the circular dependency problem in the, uh, video. We're just using a technique. You did? Yeah. So I don't remember. I know. I think so, so. so let <clears throat> me do that slowly. I, we need to create a circular dependency. Yep. I mean, that's totally normal. We are not perfect. And I don't remember a lot of, a lot of stuff. So let's call it brands and the sales that uh, uses an add columns or all product brand of, let's do sales amount, which is sales amount. Now this product depends on product brand. Now I can go here, do the relationship this way. It's a one-to-one. -one. Yeah, but it still doesn't happen. Uh, brands and sales is on the many side. I don't remember that. So let me go. Do we have uh, the final file? Uh, yeah. Or we can make it that way, Marco. I'll search because I want to answer this yeah, question. Look at, look at I, 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 <laughs> I answered another question in the meantime. Uh, by the way, exactly. I included... give me some time and I find the yes. demo. I just want to tell to the people who are watching that I copied the three links to articles 
that we have on our website where we explain the role of the blank row and the differences between the different functions that have been mentioned and when the circular dependency can happen and how to avoid that. So now the problem is that Alberto is not able to find the, and I also, we're not able to find a way to, to generate a circular dependency because we are so used to avoid that, that probably now we are not, not finding the, the way to create it. But the, the article goes, uh, the articles go in depth and provide you the information. So I, I will go to the next question and we will go back when Alberto is ready. Sounds perfect. You are in mute. You are in mute. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I think Zoom does tell me this. Um, so I'm going to stop Alberto sharing while we go through this. And I'm going to try and get the projection panel back up. And let me share my screen again. So that's what I want to do this one here. All right, so here's, um, here's a question that's come in also. I think this one's from, from Wynne. And um, well, anyway, you can read the question there. So you're gonna answer this one, Marco, but obviously it's easy to make mistakes in DAX, um, even when you're pretty sure that you've written it right, you can still make mistakes. So any general advice that you can give on writing formulas, um, getting so it right? I try, I'm trying to understand the question because I think that the question is that if I have a formula which generates a value, how can I be, you know, and the value seems good to me, but how can I be sure that the value will be good also in other reports? Is this the question or something else? I think so. And when, when you might want to just unmute yourself and clarify that. But yeah, that's, that's, my uh, that's sort of generally the idea. I guess with from the video itself, it was a case of, um, you know, there, there was, it looked like it was at the right level, but then only when you think about it in terms of the next le level of granularity, then yep. it's not quite working right. Yep. So I guess it's just the, the the thought process, rather than just physically checking every number, which I guess yeah. is one answer. Is there any other advice? That's or, a, no, no, it's a very good question. So um, well, let me just give you a, a sort of introduction to the idea that I've been a developer, I'm still a developer, but actually I'm no longer a developer for work. I just do this for hobby, like writing modules for Dax Studio. But the main thing I do today is something else. I work in data analytics, but my, my education was about, my education in IT was about writing code. And the first thing that you learn when you start writing programs is uh, the mentality, which is uh, what could go wrong? Right. In order to, when you write a program, you have to think what could go, what could go wrong, right? And this is a different mindset from the mindset of people who are just looking at, okay, I had to solve a problem quickly. Once I solved it, it's done. I don't, I no longer have to worry about it. Now, when I'm using Excel, usually I write a formula that has to work just for that specific case. I, I'm not worried about what could happen if I try to reuse this formula in a different worksheet with a different set of filters, with a different uh, table and so on. Now, when you write a formula in DAX, you are using a tool that enables you to express a, a function, right? As a sort of uh, an algorithm that could potentially work in any report of your data model. So you control the data model, but you cannot control the report. So unfortunately, I don't have a, you know, a secret to share here. The only thing that you can try to do is trying to look for the mindset that is also common to other, um, uh, other professions, like you know, people who are in security, people who are in uh, healthcare, people that who are in uh, you know, evaluation of risk for working environments, they have the same mindset. What could go wrong? What could you do that break your algorithm or your formula? So when you write a DAX expression, you should think about not what you have to solve today. I mean, you can do that if your only goal is to write a formula or a measure that has to work on your report. But the moment you share the data set with someone else and someone else would create other reports, you have to think, what could they do? 
cr crazy, right? What could they combine that could go wrong? Once you develop this mindset, the first thing you do when you write a formula is not just writing the formula for your common use case, which this is the first thing you do, but then you start looking at, okay, what happens if I include this other uh, column from another table? Now, in DAX, usually what you do, you try to create to use other columns of the same table, right? So if you created something like I slice by country, you could slice by state, which is below the country. You could group, you, you could filter or group by continent, which is above, right? You, tr you try above and below, above and below. The idea of the hierarchy that you know that the model doesn't know. And then you try to do the same for other tables that could be connected with the data that you are using, like other dimension. But in general, you know, I, I'm using a customer. Okay, I can try to use the store, the date, and, and something else. And the other thing you have to do is make sure that the total is right. Because usually the common mistake is you create something, you fit it just one year, and the total is right. And you create the same chart, you include two years, or you have the table with two or more years, and now that the grand total is no longer correct. And this is the other common issue. So think not just to solve your specific problem, but solve a, a larger amount of you know scenarios. And that, that is uh, but the idea is that what could go wrong? Ask to yourself this question and, and try to you know face the problem this way. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Um, okay. In the meantime, I do have uh, the. I found the demo file, so we can play with that. And I Would need to like show to my screen, screen again. again? Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't remember screen one. Yep. So in the. In the demo, this is a different demo file, and every time I deliver this session, I write the code differently, but. Uh, the idea is still the same. I love when that happens. Now Power BI is going to crash. So I think so sometimes I'm... when you're sharing the screen um, in Zoom, it can use a lot of resources. It can be a problem. No, the problem is a bug in Power BI. When you zoom oh, in okay. in the formula and there is the that open, it crashes. Alberto is, is using the editor, the DAX editor with, of Power BI, which is always a, a bad idea. <laughs> we, use, I know. We, started using, we started using Tabular Editor in the last few months, the Tabular Editor 3, and you, it's, it's hard to go back, to be honest. It's hard to go, to go back. Yeah. It, it should be out in a, in a few weeks, I hope. It's, it's wonderful. So while we're waiting for Alberto okay. to get his, oh, you're back. No, I'm already here. I mean, that's uh, okay. now that I have found the demo, it's pretty easy. So let's go back to the allocated budget table, which is this table. Now, this table is kind of complex, so it's not the best example to speak, talk about uh, secret dependency, but it's a... Uh, a good example in the link of uh, the Marco sent you, you have a much simpler file to discuss the theory. But the problem is that here I'm using this thing right now and everything is working. I have my allocated budget table and I can create a relationship with uh, brands. Right now, there is a no the question is whether there is or not a dependency between uh, brands product and allocated budget. Brands depends on product because brands is computed based on product. And allocated budget depends on product too, okay? So allocated budget depends on product because it uses product. It uses a product brand, uses this in here, it does other calculation using the product table. But I'm using distinct. So the dependency is based on the data. If anything changes in the product table or in the brand table, I will need to recompute allocated budget, and that is fine. When I created this relationship, many to one, there, there is another dependency which is created because allocated budget is on the many side of a many to one relationship with brands. 
meaning that if in a located budget appears a value for brand that does not belong to the brand table, the brand table will be updated with a new row. So the blank row will appear in the brand table. So allocated budget right now depends on brands and on product. Brands does not depend on allocated budget. And the reason why it does not depend on allocated budget is because I use the distinct. This thing does not return the blank row. So the, if any change happens, if I change allocated budget, because I'm using functions that do not touch the blank row, allocated budget does not depend on the presence of the blank row in brands. As soon as I use all there, not on month number, but on product, uh, brand. product brand. Yep. Then I get uh, this circular dependency that says a secret dependency was detected and then this totally useless uh, uh, error description. Basically, it's saying that uh, there is a circular dependency because all now depends on the blank row. So what happens is that if I change a brand, I need to recompute allocated budget. But if I recompute allocated budget, then the blank row might appear or not in brand. So I need to change brand. And at that point, a change in brand triggers a change in allocated budget and then goes in a loop that goes forever. Yeah. If I so can you have this basically hmm. two, two uh, chains of relationship. Ahead. One is uh, the blank row. The other one is uh, uh, dependency from data. Yeah. If you just follow the dependency from data, that's easy to understand. It's easy to follow because it comes very naturally. The dependency on the blank row is much more complex. And uh, it is more complex here because uh, there is a kind of a complex chain of relationship. We have allocated budget, uh, brand, uh, product, uh, and other tables. So finding uh, where the problem appears is kind of tricky. The easiest way to get rid of uh, circular dependency at all is to avoid using uh, um, all and instead using uh, either uh, distinct or all no blank row. All no blank row basically says, give me all the values of uh, the product brand, but ignore the presence of the blank row. And it's not really useful to ignore the blank row because that you can obtain with a filter or with other functionalities. It's important because it basically says, uh, I'm not interested in the presence of the blank row. So if you update the product table or the brand table, just because you are adding the blank row, do not recompute me because that is not needed. I'm not interested in the blank row. So the dependency goes in one way, but then it does not come back because... Uh, the update on the blank row does not trigger a recomputation of allocated budget. And so the, at that point, the secret dependency is no longer active. Yeah. Alberto, I, I want to add uh, yep. just two things. Uh, first, in this particular case, using this thing or all the blank row is the same just because we have no filter context. We are creating a calculated table, so they are the same. But um, in, in other, so if you do this in a, in a measure, then all the blank row is what you use instead of all. This thing is what you use instead of values. This is yeah. the, 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 the parallel. Uh, the other thing is, but Alberto already said that what I, what I wanted to say before, this is a relatively complex case because you have three tables involved. So the allocated budget depends on product, brands depend on product, but brands depends on uh, uh, budget too. And so it's a, not easy to realize what is the real dependent because you do, you're not mentioning budget here and, yeah. and so understanding the the, and the the error message really doesn't tell you anything helpful doesn't tell you which are the other tables involved if you look at the message even though you read the entire message you only see columns of allocated budget whereas the circular dependency is actually between different tables and i mean there is a technical explanation for that but i mean it's too we don't have time for that <laughs> So Marco, can I just clarify, because I, um, I think this has clarified it. So we're saying that um, that all no blank row is a partner with the all function and distinct is a partner with the values function. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. 
Right. And but values does values ignores the blank row anyway, right? No, 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 that's no. The values include a blank row. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. Yeah. Okay, distinct. Uh, indeed, okay. when you when you write a table expression, like for example, when you you're, when you write some x product, you are getting the table product, all the rows of the table product, without the blank row. Blank row. So if you want to get the entire table including the additional blank row that could be generated by an invalid relationship, you have to write values followed by the table name. So values can be used with one column or with an entire table reference. I knew that because of the IntelliSense, but I've never used it and I did not understand why you would ever want to use values of a table. It's very, that's the reason. The, Here's the thing. Yeah, it's, it's very, very rare to use it. Yeah, it's it's not common. It's not common. The problem is yeah. that, I mean, it will be a long discussion, but it, usually you want to use values most of the times when you filter a column, when you, when you iterate a column, but you don't want to use the blank value when you iterate a table. It's It will be a long discussion because it depends on the formulas that you usually create. And yeah, that's, but okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, good. Well, um, I'm going to be sharing Alberto so that I can share yep. this uh, screen again. So, uh, so thank you. Let me see if I can. I think this is right. So, um, I think this would be a good question for us to ask next. I think this is a very broad question, and so I'll leave it up to Marco and Alberto who to answer this question. And because I, I even like to put a bit of extra spin. So what's the best way to avoid many to many relationships? But maybe there's a broader question. Why should I? Why? I mean, it works. It's that yellow yeah, warning message. I was made. wondering Why can't the I same. What's, what's wrong with many to many relationships in Power BI? They, uh, they from work. my point of view, uh, yeah, can I? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah can yeah, I just one, one second? Um, we have a lot of content about many to many relationship and the suggestion I, when, when I teach in a class, I say, okay, guys, now that you have seen everything, do this. Whenever you have to create a bidirectional fit, a many to many relationship with a bidirectional filter or with a many to many, you have to justify it. So open your Outlook or whatever you use for the email, type to Marco, uh, why I'm writing this relation. And you have to explain me why you're doing that. If you're able to complete the, the, the email and you're convinced it is a good email, then just close it and go ahead. But if you're no, not no, able to explain it. why, yeah. <laughs> no, because <laughs> say, okay, if you want to, you, you can also send it. But the idea is that if you have to explain why you have to use it, usually you find that you are not really able. It seems that you do that just because, oh, because otherwise it doesn't work. Okay, this is not a good explanation. You have to provide a, a a clear justification because you are going to use something that is expensive, you have to justify it, right? Uh, unless you're a billionaire and then you can do whatever you want with your money, that's fine. Yeah, but I mean, there are a lot of scenarios where many to many make sense. So, so it's- uh, Indeed. There but, are but the scenario... scenarios where, where you need it. But yeah. actually, I think we are avoiding the question because uh, uh, the question is, how can I avoid it if I need to avoid it? So we can take for granted that uh, uh, Ilgar needs to get rid of many to many, maybe because of performance. And uh, I think uh, there's no easy way to do that, but you can duplicate data if you have uh, a many to many, if you have a far table that links to a many to many and then goes to another dimension, you can duplicate rows in the far table, it just increases the size of the far table. And you need to allocate values and you need to implement logic to do the calculations the right way. But if you need that to get rid of many to many, that might be an option. At least that's what you do in star schemas where you don't want to use uh, many to many. Yeah, the proper data model is the best thing. The other thing maybe that we take for granted, but just don't enable the bidirectional filter by default in the model, just enable it in the measure. We in the video, we've shown a very rare case where it is safe to use the bidirectional filter in the model. But actually that bidirectional filter has the purpose of replacing a logic that we could obtain with a many-to-many -many relationship with a single direction. So let's clarify, when we say many-to-many, -many, we can 
include two different kinds of relationship. One, rela one case where we, we say, oh, many to many, is in reality the bidirectional feature on a regular relationship, one to many relationship. Don't do that and enable the bidirectional feature only in the measures where you want to use it. Because otherwise you have um, bad side effects on any future calculation you will write. The second case is if you have a many to many cardinality relationship, which is what we use in the budgeting video at the end. With, with, so instead of using the brand column, the, the brand calculated table in the middle with the many one and one many with a bidirectional filter, we just have a single direction filter with a many to many cardinality relationship. And here is where I don't like Power BI. Power BI by default, when you create a many to many cardinality relationship, by default, it shows you, uh, it, 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 uh, the default value is bidirectional filter, which is wrong. 99% of the times, it's simply wrong. So don't enable the bidirectional filter. You probably want to transfer the filter from one table to another, not the other way around. So when you have a many to many cardinality relationship, assuming you have a good reason for that, just change the filter. It should be single, one way, and you have to make a decision what is the right direction. That, that's the normally the, the, the dimension table filters fact table, right? That's the normal behavior. Yes, yeah, of course. Typically. Yeah, yeah. And so, and then the other thing, of course, is to make sure that your dimension table has a superset, a hundred percent set of all records that are in your fact table. Yeah, otherwise you lose the, the blank record. The blank record won't get generated and it will cause a problem that you won't True. see. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's another, yeah. Okay, good. Um, thank you, uh, Ilgar, for that question. So I'm going to jump over to uh, this question from Christian. It's had a few votes, and it's also directly related to the con to the content. So I'll let you read that question rather than me reading it out. Use the budget table be without um, pivoting it first. Well, what we did in the budget table was to unpivot because the budget table contained three different scenarios, high, medium, low, or whatever we decided to call them. And you can use it without unpivoting the values in um, the values. But at that point, you would have uh, three different columns, one with the low budget, one with the medium budget, and one with the high budget. And that means that uh, whenever you want to change the scenario, you need to change the column that you want to aggregate. Uh, so you end up building a lot of measures, one which is the allocated budget low, then the allocated budget medium, then the allocated budget high. By pivoting or unpivoting, uh, what you do is uh, basically you remove three columns uh, and instead you place uh, three rows with three different values uh, for, uh, for one column and only one column containing the value. That means you can do just one measure and uh, using data, you choose uh, the scenario in an easier way. So the answer is yes, you could use the budget table without unpivoting, but uh, you would not have any benefit and you only have uh, drawbacks because you need to increase the number of calculations uh, in order to, to drive your, to choose the scenario that you need. That's a general advice. I mean, even if you had uh, months instead of having the scenarios, maybe you have a report that have different months column in all the different columns. And if you want to use the data, you just unpivot it so that the month becomes uh, one value of a specific column and the table becomes uh, thinner and easier to handle uh, data driven. Okay, thanks, Christian. Hopefully that answered uh, your question. I'm going to put this one up. So I'll let you read it. So what are your views on using Power Query or DAX to materialize extra rows in the allocated budget? Uh, what do you mean by extra rows? So, so, yeah, so um, I bet I created extra extra rows of data, right? Yeah, at some point we did the, the allocated budget table that was uh, materializing uh, the, okay. the, the number of rows. Uh, and yeah, the question is, uh, yeah. uh, well, I read it as whether it is better to do that with Power Query or with DAX. I, 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 I can answer from a, so there are many point of views. So 
The simple answer to me is what well, is it whatever you are more comfortable with, because at the end, what is what matters is the final result. Now, from a technical point of view, uh, DAX provides maybe the ability to make sure that you are always constantly updated. Whereas with Power Query, there is a small chance that you don't refresh the table, especially when you are in Power BI Desktop. You, you might choose to refresh a table, not another, and you might not be able to realize that you are not synchronized, right? Small chance, by the way. Um, the other problem with DAX, so this is a problem for Power Query. The problem with DAX is that if the table is large, it, you could have a, a memory issue. Because when you create a calculated table, the entire table has to be materialized in memory uncompressed before being compressed. Whereas in Power Query, there is a chance that with query folding, the table is materialized on SQL. And so the compression happens by segment and you don't have a high memory pressure on your Power BI desktop machine. But we're talking, uh, the problem is if you end up with millions of rows. So if you generate, you know, 1 million rows, probably you don't see the problem. When you generate 100 million rows, you certainly see the problem and you could, you could see the difference. A calculate table with 100 million rows in DAX could be a problem because of the memory required when you process it. Yeah, that's very okay, political to me. A table with 100 million rows in DAX is a huge problem. It's not that it could be a problem. You, you need but to make it small. But, yeah, okay, but... You know, but yeah, I think that the best right. advice you, you did it at the beginning, use whatever you're confident with. Yep. As long as it okay, works. Great. Thank you. Fine. Okay, I'm Shall guessing this is you. a bit of Italian at the front. <laughs> um, so a generic question this time from Roland. Um, what is the what most difficult, like to difficult bit to master when it comes to DAX? Well, I think DAX requires you I, I don't know, because the thing is, I learned DAX uh, probably too many years ago. So I take for granted that uh, a lot of concepts uh, are easy, whereas uh, they probably are not. But I think DAX requires you to change your mindset, to, to think at the code in a different way. It's a functional language. It's measure driven. And uh, there is a beautiful podcast that uh, Amir Metz did where he explains uh, to me, in a very clear way, why DAX is so hard, because DAX is all based on the, the filter context. And this entirety of the filter context, at the beginning, people do not think about it, do not consider it as the most important thing to, to learn. But once you master the raw context, the filter context, the context transition, DAX is yours. There are no secrets in DAX. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Can you add one word? Whenever. The, so I think that the problem is also that the, the, the difficulty of this question, it depends also on the people who is learning DAX. Um, clearly, for people who comes from an Excel background, the problem could be that it seems something that is close to Excel at the beginning, but it actually is very different. The, the, the model behind is very different. And... What Alberto said for those you know, people is, is enough. But the, the, the hidden problem is for the people who already has experience with other environments or languages. If you know SQL, if you know programming languages, if you know MDX, you might be in trouble. What backs people is that they found, you know, the comment from someone who never wrote a complex, you know, programming language or a complex format. So Excel does not allow you to write something that is, you know, uh, 100 lines of code, right? It, it's physically hard to write 100 lines of code in a formula in Excel. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just not easy. Um, in DAX, it happens. Uh, you could have a formula, which is long, just because if you split it in several steps, at the end, you still have a long, you know, a long script. And people who come from a different, you know, a more technical background find it much more difficult than whatever they learned before. What is the problem in that case? They try, like everybody does, um, myself included. We try at the beginning, when we learn something, we try to relate 
something new to something we already know, which works well for many programming languages because at the end, you change the syntax, but the structure is always the same. If you know Italian and you have to learn Spanish, it's relatively simple, they are close. Uh, if you know Italian and you have to learn English, it's a little bit more difficult, but certain parts of the structure of the sentence are still the same. If you have to learn Chinese, then it's a completely different word because it's a completely different language. Now, DAX has elements that are hard to find in other languages, which means that you have to be prepared to a big jump because at a certain point you have to stop finding the similarity between the concept in DAX and something you already know. I can provide you an example for the raw context. I have no idea about an example to say, oh, the filter context is like this. I don't know what this is in any other environment. It's something new that you have to learn from scratch. And this is something difficult because people are not prepared to that. What I say when I start my, uh, when, when I teach a class, I say, what do you know? What do you know? Do you know? Okay, that's fine. Forget everything. Forget everything. Because if you try to match what I'm going to say with something you know, you're going to fail. Because it's not the same. It's different. And this difference is what will create problems. So it's try to be prepared to, to learn something new in this, uh, in this, in this course. Um, I'd like to just add a little bit to this as well, because it's one of my favorite topics. Yeah. And I totally agree with everything that you've both said, and that it depends on whether you come from a SQL background or from an Excel background. And I, I see this in my training all the time, that these two groups of people, these two cohorts learn in a different way. And I have a theory as to why this is the case. Now, in for, for a SQL professional, they're coming from a scripted language world and they're encouraged to go into a script editor and to type a piece of the puzzle, exactly the way you see Alberto do it in so many demonstrations where he opens up DAX Studio and he starts and he writes a simple table. Give me a list of all the brands and then give me, you know, add a column to that that has the total sales in it. And you're starting from the inside out and you're encouraged to do that using a scripting tool to write the code and you end up with this monster. And I often use um, the the code that you guys write in my training, I say, look at this formula. Now, do you think that Alberto started at the first line, evaluate, and then started writing the second line and then the third line? No, that's not how he does it. He starts in the center and he writes this piece and then he grows from the inside out, wrapping pieces around it. And he probably doesn't even know how to debug that code without going back to the center and working his way out again, right? Yes. So now my the point I'm making is that the SQL people, people that are used to that scripting engine, have that structure presented to them. So they have to learn to do it that way. Now, the Excel people, it's completely different. The Excel people are on a spreadsheet canvas with individual cells, and they're encouraged to write pieces of a formula in one cell. And then when they write a formula, they see the answer. So then they copy it down and then they see the answer and then they put a subtotal and then they see the answer wow. and then they multiply it and they see the answer. And so in a way, the spreadsheet is giving them that structure to think through their problem as opposed to the scripting tool, which is the tool that SQL people. And in my view, that's why the Excel people struggle so much to make this, this look. And the best way they can, they can make progress is to, and, and I now completely teach completely different the way I used to. I encourage people to go and do a calculated column, go and create a, a, a table using all and see, look at it, see what happens, then go and put it back inside your measure. Because now you can conceptualize that all is producing a table that contains all the distinct values in a column. That concept for an Excel person is actually quite difficult because if they can't see it on the screen, they can't wrap their head around it. This, this is my experience with it. Um, yeah. no, it's a general very, 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 very good point. point. Very good point. Yeah. Okay, great question. Um, thank you. You like the um, Italian cop? Yeah, very good, Italian. All right, so let me, I've got so many screens happening here. Um, I did, ha I'm going to ask, put this one up. Oops, uh, this one here. This is actually from Iman. And, um, now, what happened? 
what's going on here. Oh, Iman, I'm sorry. I think I accidentally dismissed the question. The question was, um, any tips on visuals? What type, any custom visuals or good visual tools to use when you're doing budgeting and planning? That's what the question was, but I think so, I accidentally- Especially when you want to watch back and do some planning and- so, I, I can I can answer to this because I, this is a for, for a number of reasons something I, I investigated recently. The let's start from the problem. The problem is that let's say Power BI doesn't have good standard visualizations if you have you know balance sheet or profit and loss statement, right? So this is just the, the starting point, right? That there is no way to to easily display this data, assuming you have a good data model for that. Now. Uh, there are companies out there that created custom visualizations that try to approach this problem. I, I think there are several custom visuals today. One common one is Zebra BI, which has uh, you know something in the middle between something for the profit and loss statement and uh, a star. I don't remember the, the the name, the acronym, but there is a standard uh, that. Is, 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 is made to create visualizations for, for the data, for financial data, and they implemented the standard too. There are other companies that have, that are be, that have been doing the same. I remember at least, you know, Power On probably, it has also a, a solution for creating the budget. I, so Zebra BI, Power On, there is another company who will launch a new visualization in the next, in May when there is the MBAS, uh, so I, I think they are sponsor and they will show that. Uh, and, and I don't remember if there is another one. So I, I don't have enough experience to, to tell you which one is best, but certainly you have to look for a custom vision of one of these uh, relatively large companies. I mean, relatively because they are large compared to the ecosystem of the visual, custom visuals in Power BI. Because otherwise, if you open the marketplace, there are hundreds of customers. But those custom visuals that can do something for that are a relatively small number. One of the issues could be the certification that could be not something that you can take for granted for many of these visuals because of what they have to do. And sometimes it's not compatible with the certification. You have to look in the specific visual. If the certification is something you need, then you have to you know, probably restrict your, your search even though it would be a topic for another hour, whether the certification for Power BI visuals is important or not, but that's another story. Sure, thanks, Marco. <laughs> so, uh, so Wynn just made a comment. So the standard that you referred to is IBCS, Internet yes, Business Communication Standards. Yeah, right, and right. so Andre has, is part of that group that sets those standards, and he, so he's putting that within that tool. Yep. Um, okay, good. So let me go to a more generic question. I'll try and click the right button this time rather than clicking it as answered. So I'll let um, everyone read that rather than me reading it out. Uh, Alberto, you want to answer or I have a... <laughs> uh, I'm scared because if you start to answer, this is never going to end because no, you're no, going no. to the... Tiny no, 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 details, no. I so. promise. I promise. I promise. If you I promise, promise you make it short, then I promise. Ahead. That's all yours. I make it short. <laughs> uh, the time intelligence operation, if you use the standard DAX functions, you go always at the day level granularity. And so there is no way that you move to the storage engine, the calculation uh, above the day level, which could be a problem when you have many years. Solution, don't you, if you have that kind of problem and you want to do calculation at, you know, the week level, month level, quarter level, year level, and you want performance, just use other techniques. We have in on daxpatterns.com, we have four different patterns just for the time intelligence. There is only one using the standard time, DAX time intelligence functions. The other three don't use them and they could be much faster, especially when you work at other levels. The month, uh, Pattern is actually what you want to look for at to get a 10, you know, you go 30 times faster just because you don't tell at the day level, you go at the month level. And so you reduce by 30, the granularity that you move to the, to the formal engine and you get a huge performance improvement in that case. Yeah. Was it fast that enough? Was shorter. 
Uh, absolutely. So, and I think no, I think we can really. Yep. Sorry, Alberto. Please go ahead. Now, I think this needs to be stressed even more. A lot of people use time intelligence and use data at the day level when they don't actually need it at all. And then they struggle saying, oh, but I have 31 days in January. How can I compare 31 days in January with 28 days in February? And the DAX code becomes a nightmare of uh, if and checks and tests where they could just have one row per month uh, and the problem disappears uh, automatically. So if you are searching for performance, uh, removing rows and reducing granularity is by far the best thing that you can do in your model that solves most of the issues. Okay. So Mark, I just wanted to ask the following follow-up question clarification. So when you're using the inbuilt time intelligence functions, you're not able to leverage the storage engine as much because of the day level of granularity. And by writing a custom function, say just using uh, the year column of your calendar table, you will automatically get improved performance um, orders of yes. magnitude. Wow, that's great to know. The, the order of um, magnitude is because you reduce the, the, the volume. Of, so sometimes you cannot see the difference because the query was fast the same. But if you measure the difference that you have at the storage engine level at the formal engine level, you go from, you know, five, 10 milliseconds to maybe 200, 300 milliseconds. Now, when you touch the seconds area, you, you, you see the difference. And so this could be a huge, huge, huge improvement, especially when you have many measures, or that's, a, that's because you leverage the number yeah. of measures by the number of uh, uh, days in a, in a month. You can see huge differences, believe me. Okay, so, so top tip, um, avoid the inbuilt time intelligence functions. It um, depends. Albert, it depends. I made a note, <laughs> yeah. and I wanted just to check. Sorry, so going back to a previous question, you mentioned the podcast um, featuring Amir. Was that the one by Casper? Yes. Yeah. Casper yeah, made so, it with and Amir. So okay. And yeah. So if, I, mean, I, um, I enjoyed so it so much. Okay, I did see that it came up, and I um, I have intended to watch it. But so what I'll do is I'll put I'll post a link in the chat for that, and um, so that sounds like a must have a must watch for for other people. All right, so let me tick this one off, and uh, get some space here. Um, Okay, a little bit uh, strange, uh, uh, well, you know, perhaps non-DAX, not a strange question. It's a valid question, so some interest here. Um, but a little bit uh, guy in a cube um, stuff here. <laughs> so, yeah, what's your experience been with your journey? I mean, your content has changed over the years. It used to be very blog-based and technologies have changed. Yeah, yeah. we changed Would you, you like to comment? Ah... Uh... Alberto, well, be short a, because you like this question. So you have to be short like I was in time intelligence. I'll please. make it very short. Uh, the short version is that uh, we always wanted to have uh, a YouTube channel. We never had uh, the time to create YouTube videos. And from a technological point of view, also we didn't have all the stuff required to make it quick and easy. Now, thanks to COVID, we didn't have a, we had a lot of time to stay at home, so it was a good point where to to start uh, recording uh, YouTube videos. So regarding script and unplugged, uh, then here me and Marco we have completely different uh, uh, view. Marco loves uh, the unplugged videos. Uh, I I like the script, but beware that there is no difference actually between a script video and an unplugged video. The only difference is that. Uh, for what you call a script video, if there are really mistakes or bad mistakes during the video recording, uh, we just cut them because uh, it's not interesting to, to see us uh, making mistakes and we want to keep them short. The unplugged videos are always one take. So whatever happens, uh, it's there. And there can be funny moments, there can be problems, there can be, you can hear us uh, screaming if at some point something doesn't work. So that's the, the main difference between a script and an unplugged video. And actually, to be honest, nearly nothing is script. We always start from the problem, we describe it, we know where we are going, but there is no, 
there's no clear script of the video. What you see is exactly we mentioned Alberto also that when you do your demos, you often write different versions of the formula, right? You're actually just you're literally just redoing it on the fly rather yeah. than following some, some script as such. Yeah, that's a problem of mine. If you ask me to write twice of the same formula, I wouldn't be able to remember that. So I, I need to retype it again and rethink it again. Yeah, but that highlights a very important process because people have asked about DAX and how they become good at DAX. And, and so what, what your statement just highlighted is the importance of learning the process, not the importance of learning a formula, right? You have yeah. to learn the process to write the formula. The final formula doesn't matter as long as it's performant, of course. But, um, can I just ask another question on that? So do you guys do your own video editing or do you have someone to do that for you? Uh, no, we do everything uh, at home right now, mainly because I like a lot to do this stuff. So I enjoy doing uh, video editing and all uh, the other steps. We might decide to use video editors in the future because uh, right now we are not traveling, so we have a lot of time. But as soon uh, as... Uh, I, want yeah. to, I want to, just because uh, not all of the videos we have are uh, you know, self-made, all the videos in our training as of today are recorded with a professional staff. And also some of the videos we publish on uh, YouTube at the beginning were recorded that way because we had not much time. And so we, we, we use the time, the recording time for courses also to produce videos for YouTube. Yeah. Then of course with the pandemic, this changed a little bit. And so we had more time to, to work on the back, you know, on the back office work for producing the videos, but we are not, I mean, personally, I don't spend too much time on editing, even though also myself had to, you know, start to be introduced in those uh, tools, uh, but it's not, I mean, I'm not engaged as much as Alberto in this stuff, for example. Yeah, it's definitely not your cup of tea, but it's mine, so I like it. Yeah. And that always happens. So whenever you see something produced by me and Marco, we always work together. The, one does what the other doesn't like. And I think this is the, the strength of uh, uh, we working together. Makes sense. And I work on my own. And so I don't have anyone to give the work I don't like to. And so it just doesn't get done. <laughs> I only do the stuff that I like <laughs> doing. Okay, good. Um, look, I'm going to put this one up from, uh, from Kane. I think, uh, I think Kane might work for um, Iman. Um, and there was a question, there was a comment, Kane. I'm not sure whether you're able to unmute yourself and just clarify this because I think your comment said you meant to say enabling bi directional filters. I'm just not 100% sure uh, what that means. Are you, are you there and not able to unmute yourself, Kane? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I meant. I'm applying um, bi directional filters with a, uh, with, a, with a calculation group. So should you have them on or off? Is that what you're asking? Or? Uh, no, just if, just around uh, any benefits. Um, you know, obviously we were talking before about um, it not being a good idea to enable them in the model, but to do it in, in DAX and calculations. And then, you know, the calculation yeah. groups, another way that you could do it. So technically, I, I can answer to this this way. Technically, we can use calculation groups to change the active relationship using user relationship. So it's, it, it's a nice way to, you know, if you have several dates in a table, you can switch between, you know, order date, delivery date, due date, just with a slicer, right? Because the slicer is the calculation item. You can do the same for the bi-directional filter if you want. You could uh, change the direction of the propagation using the cross filter. So technically there is nothing wrong doing that. And I think it's relatively easy to implement. My problem today with the calculation groups in general, and in particular for this kind of uh, application is that the consumption experience we have in Power BI is uh, not ideal. You know, remember I'm very polite. So it's not ideal because uh, whenever I have a matrix or a chart and I'm interested in having two or three measures, which are the combination of a certain measure and a certain 
modified in a calculation group. Let's say I want to see the sales amount without any change. And then I want to see the sales amount with a cross filter. Then I want to see the margin without the cross filter. So I, I want to create an arbitrary combination of measures and calculation groups applied so that my matrix has five columns. Each column is a different combination, which is not just the, 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 all the possible combinations. Now, there is some work around to that which is you could create a slicer, you can put uh, everything there, then you create a funny, uh, you know, fake measure just to enable the slicer in a hierarchical way or use a custom slicer, but come on, it's, it's too complex. You have to change the report. You have to inject in the report more, you know, more elements just to work around the limitation of the consumption experience, which should be natively, uh, that should enable natively to, to, to specify oh, I want to do this and this and this. The way to work around that today is to create other measures. And so if I had to create other measures just to simplify the visualization at this point, the advantage of having calculation groups is gone. So that's my problem with that, with with because how much can I leverage on that? This is my problem today. And, but, yeah, I think and there's nothing wrong with that. What you would use field items and sets in Excel to solve that problem? Yeah, so say that again. You know, in Excel, field, you have the field field items you have a set. Sets, yeah. yeah, a set, yeah. Marco, I think there is also a, a more subtle problem uh, with uh, using calculation groups uh, and changing uh, the, the, the cross filter of a relationship. Uh, a calculation group, a calculation item is applied uh, at the beginning of the calculation tree and uh, it works for the entire calculation tree. So if a calculation item changes the cross filter direction of a relationship, your entire formula will be computed with that bidirectional cross filter set on. And if you want to mix in the same uh, calculation, part of the calculation that uses bidirectional, part that does not use it, uh, then you are in trouble because a calculation item will not allow you to do that uh, in an easy way. So yes, of the answer is yes, you can, of course, uh, just beware, it, uh, it might not be the right tool uh, to, to do the job. Yeah. If it is, it's fine, but uh, there are some issues that you might find. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. That. I agree. Okay, I might throw this one up. It sort, of, it sort of flows on from the previous conversation from of your comments, uh, Marco, um, but just a generic question about um, yep. use relationship as a function. Any comments on that? Use relationship is a function that enables an inactive relationship. So the question is, why should you have an inactive relationship in your model? Well, the answer is that is the best way to manage what we call shared dimensions for, for multiple uh, instances of the same attribute in the same table. Let me give you a clear example. In an invoice, I could have several dates. I have the date of the order, the date of the shipment, the date of the invoice, the date of the payment. We have four dates. Now, how do you approach in data modeling, from a data modeling perspective, these four dates? Well, you have two options, basically. One is that you create four copies of the date table, or you create just one copy of the date table, and you have four relationships between the date table and the sales table. In the latter case, you have only one active relationship at a certain point in time, and you can switch the active relationship to another one by using use relationship. The advantage, so 90, 95% of the times, the right, the best, the better uh, design decision is to go through this uh, architecture. So you have four relationships and you have different measures because you usually want to create in the same visualization, multiple measures sharing the same date. If you create multiple dates, what you get as a result is that you can see the sales amount by order date or the sales amount by payment date. But if you want to create a single visualization, a chart, a bar chart with the two bars, you cannot. And the only way to obtain that is to use this approach or to use a very, very complex formula, which removes the ability, you know, the advantage of having a, a data model uh, in, in Power BI. 
Very good. Thank you. Um, so let's, I think this question here from Reza looks uh, quite good. It's got the most votes. So I'll let you read the question. Do we have an article about that, Marco? Yes, I'm, I'm, if you, do you want to find the article or I find the article? And I, the other person replies. Uh, you search the article because I totally don't remember the title of the it. article. Implement non-visual totals with Power BI security roles. I'm copying the link here. Yeah, the problem is here that we, we I, named I, the article non-visual total and nobody knows what a non-visual total sorry, is. I, I, I sent to my, oh, sorry, I have to send to everyone. I don't know why. Okay, okay. in the meantime, I sent to you, yeah. I sent I to the link the now. Uh, if you have a role level security, you no longer see the totals because as soon as a user is uh, secured, he will not see the grand total. He will only see the total of what he is allowed to see. So in order to compute this total and make it visible. What you need to do is compute it in a point where security is not yet applied. And the easiest way to do that is to create a, a calculated table that computes those totals, only the total. So it removes all the details and just computes, let's say the total by country. Uh, the table will not be secured. So everybody can see those totals, just the totals. And then when you need to compute the values for uh, the sales amount that this user can look at, you compute the sales amount using the sales table and that is secured. But when you want to compute that total, instead of computing it from sales, you compute it from the other table that you recompute it as a calculated table where the total has been properly accumulated. It's straightforward, it's pretty simple, and you can use it in a lot of different scenarios. Whenever you want some values, typically very aggregated values, to be visible despite of uh, security. And uh, the, the link uh, that Marco posted uh, shows uh, how to do that. Uh, that feature was called uh, non-visual totals in the time of MDX, because uh, uh, what you see is not uh, the visual total that would be what you see, so the sum of the values that you see, but uh, it's the sum of everything. Uh, that was somewhat the default behavior in MDX because it was faster to compute. And uh, it's no longer the default, and it's harder to compute now in DAX. And maybe that's a use case for a many-to-many -many relationship if you're doing a, um, a higher grain total, which then needs to be joined back to a dimension. So if you've got a sales rep table, for example, and you want to yeah. compute the percentage of the state, you might end up joining a many-to-many -many relationship of your summarized state table yep. um, using the techniques we yeah. talked about before. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so there's a with a single direction here. filter, with a single direction yeah, filter, with right? With a single direction filter, filter, which is not the default, yeah. which is not the default in Power BI. That's a huge mistake. Yeah, yeah for sure. So this one's from Rod, um, and I think this is actually a question about um, ragged hierarchies. Maybe I'm not really yeah. sure. Yep. Yeah, the idea is that today, so technically. When we create a structure with different levels, a hierarchy, we have a constraint in, uh, in, uh, in Power BI, which is we always have to keep data for all the levels. Now, the ancient engine that we use today in Power BI, which is the multidimensional one, had a nice way to deal with this uh, kind of structure where I was able to define, oh, look, uh, here, uh, we had to mute Albert, okay. Um, I was saying, in this structure, we have, I don't know, country, uh, state, city. But then you have a very small country, which doesn't have the, the state, for example, and you want to skip it, right? We, you want to move from level one to level three, skipping level two, only for that particular branch of the hierarchy. Now, nothing of this exists in Power BI. Nothing of this exists in DAX. DAX and Power BI in general don't have any idea about the notion of a hierarchy. The, visual, the visualization of the levels of a hierarchy is just a visualization 
in the Power BI UI, but actually it doesn't have any effect with the DAX syntax. So if one day we would have some hierarchical function in DAX, that would be a possibility. Today, we can just find workarounds, but any workaround has problems. So I, I, will not, I don't have a real uh, generic suggestion here. It really depends, right? Depends on what you need to achieve because one, one thing you could do, you could move you know, the city to the state level because it, it will be displayed just below, but then it doesn't have the same meaning at that point. So you may want to duplicate the columns. You could create the columns that are all hidden because they, you show those copies in the hierarchy. But when you do that, you change the level according to the visualization. But when you need to get the list of the states, you have to get the, 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 the column with the state because otherwise you have cities there that are not supposed to be there. So it's, uh, I, would eval I would evaluate case by case because every choice has a lot of consequences. You have to understand what is the trade-off you can, you can accept. So the short answer so was that, no, there's no way. You know, it's... <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> it's always hard to say, but. <laughs> So okay, it sounds it. like with uh, the example from Rod, the answer is um, when you get to state for New Zealand, you just put New Zealand in there again. And for Singapore, you do the same three levels. Yeah, which yeah. is, it's not Life very elegant, hard. but that's the way to do it. I know. Yeah. Or do it in Excel and just delete those rows from your visual. And then, then the problem goes away. <laughs> just use yeah. single cells in Excel. This is where the expectation of being able to do anything comes from, right? Is in Excel, right? We can always solve the problems in Excel because we don't have to yeah. deliver the same structure across a entire table of data. We can just over, override any exception one at a time. I have to say that those uh, custom visuals we discussed before, they could have a specific feature for that, but just for the visualization. So one problem is solving the visualization Another problem is solving the calculation issue. There are two different problems in DAX. We don't have any solution for the calculation. Custom visuals might have sort of solutions, partial solution for the visualization issue. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, let, I keep getting these screens on top of each other. So let me just go ahead and bring... We've got, we've got three more questions at this stage and we're sort of, so we're planning to wrap up in about 15 minutes anyway. So let's, uh, we'll keep going and, and see how we go. So there's the next question. Well, it depends. I don't know, Alberto, if you, it's, it's a question about where you want to store the, the budget. Yeah, but what I'm wondering, I mean, if you have the data already in Excel, why converting it to CSV to host the file somewhere? You can no, just I... put it on one drive or put it on uh, any, SharePoint. any SharePoint or one drive, connect direct, directly to the yep. Excel file, read data from there. I see no value in converting to a CSV because CSV is not safer than Excel. It's not better. It has no advantages at all. Maybe, maybe there, could be, a... there could be an, an, yeah, another problem, which is not the format, not the, the file format, but the way you put the data in Excel. So the way you put the data in Excel could be not a table that is easy to read in uh, Power BI. So if you have a structure which is easy to read for a human, but not for a computer, then you, yeah, you have to, but you can do this in Excel. You could have a hidden worksheet where you prepare the data in the format you would like to import in, uh, in Power BI. That, that could be, you also have in Excel, you have Power Query. So you could do this in Power Query. You, could, you, you can have, but if you have a simple table in Excel, it just works. There is no reason to, to duplicate it. Okay, great, thank you. So um, I like this question, um, be interested to hear responses. How do we analyze the actions for submission? If you table. do not have a dimension table, create a dimension table. Yeah. I mean, which is, a, it's which a, is exactly what, what Alberto did. 
Yeah, what Alberto did is exactly this because he created a table with the brands, but he didn't have a, a table with the brands. You could do the same, right? Because you have something from the ERP, something from your budget table, but you have some attributes, some column that can define how you want to join the data. And it is exactly what you can find in the example. Just try to convert the, the, the example that we prepared in the video with something that matches your, your structure, but you will just have different names or the structure is, should be the same. So this is star scheme of everything. Create the dimension table. Don't try and do a many to many relationship between your budget oh, yeah. table and your no, actual table. Yeah. Create That's the dimension amazing. table, get the one to many up, yes. do it properly. <laughs> star scheme all the things. We keep on repeating that all the time. We published yesterday an article and a video about that. We, it's, you know, we are flooded by comments. And the, uh, the, the video is about the performance, right? And many people are happy because they finally have something to show to other people who say, no, no, this is low. So we had to go with a flat, you know, we, we need a single flat, flat table and, and that's it. But the reality is that the star schema Yes, it's fast, but the real reason to use the star schema, it solves, it forces you to solve uh, um, data modeling issues that makes the model and the measures easier to write and easier to use. You don't do that, you just delay the problem of solving certain ambiguities at the moment when you write the report. And so your DAX is more complex, the report is lower, and the numbers may be not what you want because you forgot something that you are forced to fix if you have to prepare a star schema. So the star schema is also a way to have a, a clear goal to put the data in a shape that is easy to manage. That's the most important reason why I suggest people to go to that kind of data modeling structure. Thank you. I, I, I mean, we, everyone in this space, um, is familiar with this topic. And I, I early on thought that a star schema was the most efficient and it's only more recently. And I watched the video that you referred to that Alberto did, I watched that this afternoon as well and confirmed that actually in many cases, the flight table is faster. And so I think the key, I don't wanna give away the punchline Alberto, but the key takeaway was yes, the flight table can be faster, but when it is, it's only a little bit faster and when it's not faster, it's terrible. When she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was horrible, right? So yeah. um, so you wouldn't do it for performance reasons. Um, so it's actually more a modeling conceptual um, solution rather than, than anything else. Okay, yep. uh, excellent. Uh, okay, so I, I'd like to ask, uh, so we've got one here from Irene. So we'll put this one up because we've got a vote. So this is a more of a visualization problem, I think. Yeah, the problem is that the only way to achieve this, so, so the question is about, I want to pick one measure and I want to see two values in the visualization. Now, technically the only way to obtain that is to create a measure that returns a string. But the moment you have a string, you lose a lot of features because you, are, you, you don't have something you can use in a chart. You don't have something you can use with a, you know, synthesis highlighting, and even just the right getting the right um, alignment is difficult because uh, it, unless you use a non-proportional font, non-proportional font, you you will see the data that is not aligned correctly, right? Because what you want to get, you you want to see two columns, even though you chose one measure. Now, this is not possible. Uh, I think the only workaround for that is using the KPIs, but act also the KPIs don't have a real way to solve this problem. Even though technically you could use, but you always have to pick two elements because you always have to pick two elements of the KPI and bring them into the matrix, uh, creating at the end two columns. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's a real solution. So probably no. I think that's one for ideas.powerbi.com. Perhaps search for 
mm. an existing idea. It's always better to vote for one that's got lots of votes already than to create a yeah. hundred different ideas with one vote. So go to ideas.powerbi.com and search for that one because I, I understand the problem and uh, these things will get solved only if they get attention with the development team. Okay, um, so a question yeah, here. It, the, the problem would be easy to solve if they provide a formula Sorry, uh, another uh, an additional field to replace the the value visualization. So even though I want to use ninety for the, the the measure for the chart, but I want to display another string in place of the number there. And and today is mm -hmm. this is not possible. Yeah, like an alternative display string. Yeah, which is still calculated. Okay, we'll we'll tell them to phone Mark when they when they want to do that development uh, opportunity. Yeah. All right. So, how about this one? Well, that uh, I translate the question in something that more people can understand because the way we use the bidirectional filter today was not possible several years ago, and we were forced to use another technique which involved creating a calculate statement, providing a table in the arguments in the filter arguments of calculate to obtain as a result, the, the same effect of the bidirectional filter. Now, I would say that most of the times the bidirectional filter is faster. From a technical point of view, there are a few small corner cases where the filter table could be faster, but they are not relevant. It's similar to what we discussed about the, um, the fat table and the star schema, right? There, there, there could be, you can find a very, 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 very strange case where when you use the filter table, you can get the better performance by, of the bidirectional filter. But the difference is small, and 99% of the times it is much worse than that. So, so I would say that, yeah, usually we today, we, because the engine allows the, us to do that, we use the bidirectional relationship. The only thing to consider from a, from, from if you look at the, the results, not at the performance. There is an important difference. When you look at the grand total where you have no filters, when you have no filters, the bidirectional filter is not applied, right? And when you apply the filter table, the bidirectional filter is always applied also in the grand total, which is a big cost in terms of performance, but sometimes is what you want. So there are a few cases where you actually want the result of that. Now, there are other ways to obtain the same result also with the bidirectional filter, but you still have to write some DAX code. So that, that there is a difference also in the result that you have to be aware of. But usually 99% of the time, you want to use the bidirectional relationship, yes. So it sounds like black magic might be dead. It's over. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, very good. We've got one last question here, and that takes us pretty much to right on time. We couldn't have uh, scripted that any better. So a question wins. I'll let you read the question. How big is big, I think, is the question, right? Depends on yeah. the money you have. Depends. <laughs> the more the money, the larger the number. Easy. Well, so not that. If you have a lot of yeah. money, you build a hundred dimension, then... <laughs> no, you, you, can, you, can, uh, you can always throw the money out of the window easily. Yeah, I know. But in general... For the you know regular humans here, which have uh, regular laptops and so on, I would say that a dimension with above one million rows uh, is always a dimension that could pro could put you in trouble. Today, I would raise the number to two four million rows in most of the cases because uh, you know a few years ago, one million rows was always a problem. Today, it depends. It could be two, it could be four, it could be five, 10. But usually when you go above one, you start to see the performance issue. Maybe it is not something that you can be worried about for your reports, but it's something you might want to consider. For the fact table, actually up to 100, 200 million rows, usually is not a big deal. But more than that, you have to start worrying about compression, segments, partitions, time to refresh and also performance in the queries. Alberto, do you agree or you will prove you will yeah. you will put another no I think the other consideration is how many tables are too many. And uh, 
there's not yeah. a clear number here. You you cannot say that uh, ten tables is good and a hundred tables is bad. Uh, even though ten tables is good and a hundred table is bad, I think the best advice uh, is that uh, the model will be used by users. So. If you create too many tables, uh, a user will spend more time searching for the column to use uh, than uh, use it in the report. If on the other hand, you create just five, 10 different tables, then usability is much better. So I would go around five, 10, maybe 15 dimensions, but 15 is already large. Five, 10 dimension looks uh, more usable. And for the fact tables, uh, how many, as many as you need. There you do not have, uh, because dimension is on fact tables is where you just have numbers that need to be aggregated. But for sure, if you have uh, 50 dimensions, that's a serious problem because users will not be able to browse a model with 50 dimensions. There are just too many. And it's like- If I can- Yeah, go If ahead. I can add something to what Alberto is saying, it, it's clear that to, I have seen many Power BI reports we have that have a uh, 60, 100, tables and it's not wrong from a certain point of view because you actually have those different entities right but the problem is that when you when you look carefully about why you have all those dimensions you realize that many of these dimensions are there, many of these tables are there because oh because i had these tables in the data source but yeah. you could apply That's transformation right. so that you can consolidate many of these uh, tables in dimensions that represent business entities. I have seen too many times um, sort of snowflake schema where you actually had offices and then you had the country, you had, you had you know, five or six tables that were created just because you had you know, a hierarchy described in several tables and they had been imported all together. And there was also justification for that, oh, because this table is connected to this level, this other fact table is connected to the other, this other dimension to another level. But again, you end up when you go, so when we say, once you approach the dimensional modeling, you learn that there is the star schema and the snowflake schema. Now the snowflake schema is a variation of the star schema, which seems a good idea for to solve certain problems, but it can quickly become a nightmare to manage where, because it, it makes your model much more complex, right? It, you, could still, you could still control it, but for Power BI, the performance of the snowflake schema is lower than the star schema. And the star schema is better from many other point of views. And because we have now the many-to-many -many cardinality relationship, we can solve the problem of the granularity of the connection between the dimension and the fact table, even though they are not the same granularity. So at the end, if you spend time trying to figure out what are my business entities, and you describe the data model in terms of the reports you want to create and not in terms of, oh, this is the data I have, you will simplify the model a lot. You will make the life easier to the user and you will also improve the performance of the reports. Very wise words, I'm sure. Okay, look, we're right at the top of the hour and I, so I'd like to wrap up here. Um, so thank you, um, Alberto and Marco. It's actually been a pleasure to have you available for a chat. So this is sort of almost like one of those unplugged sessions. There's lots of um, questions that have come through in a variety of topics. And um, so I appreciate your time. I'm glad we'll be able to accommodate you at a good time of the day for you and particularly Alberto, because Marco tells me that you tend not to get up very early. <laughs> Alberto, is that true? <laughs> yeah, he's right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so great. So, um, Iman, any um, any final words from you um, before we wrap? Um, just a reminder that our next meetup will be 12th of May. Uh, Peter Myers will present about uh, real time reporting in Power BI. So, we will announce it hopefully very soon. Thanks. And any update on the reactor availability for Sydney? Who's Not yet. Michael? No, I'm going to check again next week. No. So we're, we're going for the record, the sixth month in a row when we said next month we're going to go back to face-to-face. -to -face. So we'll see how we go. So, uh, so okay, thank you, gentlemen. Now, there's a few links that we talked about. Um, so maybe I will dig out those links and include them in the, uh, in the meetup.com session. And, um, and Marco, there was one thing that you mentioned that I don't have the links for, and that was 
the time intelligence. You said you wrote three or four articles on time intelligence efficiency. Yes, using I can copy um, immediately. If you, if, you could, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you could send me those, that would be great. And then I'll include right. those for, for the benefit of everyone. Okay, thanks I'm everyone for joining. Talking. Have a good rest of the evening. Thank, Thank you. you. You two Thank guys you, have bye. a good day. Yeah. Christian, Marco. you have a good yeah. day as well. Okay. Hope to see you in bye. Australia very soon. Oh, really, I, I really want to travel again very, very soon. Uh, Matt, I just copied the link into the chat. Okay, window. great. Okay? Okay, Thanks. great. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. 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 Mm -hmm.